So any questions on the material we have covered so far? All right, so on Wednesday we talked about a single factor cross. We're going to talk about a two factor cross now. All right, so a single factor cross, we only looked at one trait. When we're looking at a two factor cross, we're looking at two traits. All right, so we're following the inheritance of two different traits. All right, so we're going to talk about Mendel and his pea plants again. All right, so he crossed two strains of pea plants uh, that bred true for two characteristics this time. And in this example, he used seed color and seed shape. And there's two possible patterns that can emerge. All right, so the genes can be linked together. So the variants are going to uh, be found together, and parents are always going to be inherited as a unit. All right, we're going to talk about that a little bit later. For right now, we're going to focus on that these two genes are independent. All right, they can be independent. Uh, variants are randomly distributed into gametes. All right, so their distribution does not rely on another gene and how they're going to be distributed to those gametes. All right, so Mendel did a two-factor cross, and I kind of blew up the picture here because there's a lot going on here. So if we're looking at a two-factor cross, we can also draw out a Punnett square. It's going to be a little bit more complex, but basically we find all the possible combinations that the sperm can have, every possible combination that the eggs can have, and do a Punnett square the same exact way. All right, so when Mendel did this, the, uh, this is the results that he gathered. All right. And he found that uh, the data for the F2 hybrids, remember we have the parental generation, we have the F1, and then we have the F2, all right? For the F2 hybrids, uh, it was consistent with an independent assortment hypothesis, all right? Because he always noticed that the ratio of phenotypes would be a 9 to 3 to 3 to 1, right? And we can see that here, 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio. All right, now, so in this experiment, he created dihybrid offspring because we're looking at two traits, so di meaning two, all right, different from the monohybrids that we looked at in the single factor cross. And he came up with this idea of independent assortment. All right, so we've already kind of talked about independent assortment a little bit when we talked about meiosis. All right, so alleles of different genes are going to assort independently of each other during the process that gives rise to gametes. All right, we know that process to be meiosis. All right, so again, the assortment of one gene is not relying on how another gene is being assorted. All right, we can see this during meiosis. We've already covered this, and that we can have random alignment of those chromosome pairs during meiosis one, during metaphase one, uh, to see the, that leads to independent assortment of genes found on different chromosomes. All right, so I've showed you this picture before. We can have arrangement of genes at uh, the metaphase plate that looks something similar to this. Right? One side we have red-blue, the other side we have blue-red. Or it could line up randomly like this. One side has both blues, one side has both reds. All right? uh, no matter which way they line up, right, they're always going to create gametes, but depending on which way they line up, is going to determ determine the genetic makeup of the gametes that we end up with. All right? so, different allele combinations in these different cells depending on how they line up with at that metaphase plate. All right, so let's start with a group question. And I want you to think about that freckle analogy we had before. before. And this time we're going to do a two-factor cross. All right, we're assuming that freckles and tongue curling are independent genes, that they're not linked together. And we're going to draw a Punnett square with their possible genotypes. All right, so tongue curling, if you can stick out your tongue and curl it versus if you cannot. All right, what would the phenotypes of the offspring be and what would be the phenotypic ratio for this cross? If you need paper, let me know. Work together with a group. And if you're feeling brave, come on up to the board and draw a punnett square. I don't have a pencil. <laughs> I'd say if anyone else wants to do it first. Oh. But if no one else volunteers, how about it? Thank you. 
Some of that stuff's in there. You don't like my artwork? Looks like that one has disappeared out of the classroom. Oh, I'm just that's still making sense. Yeah. this is we're taking that mother genotype and we're splitting it into every single possible gamete combination that can occur from the mom. All right. So if we look at this uh, P example again, all right, the F1 generation, meaning both the mom and the dad have this uh, genotype. All right. We can have big R, uh, big Y as one of the combinations, little r, big Y, big r, little y, little r, little y. Right? Those are all the possible combinations that those gametes can have after meiosis. All right? Now, same with the father. All right? So if we write out all these possible gamete combinations, all right, and we don't want to split up the R and the Ys, all right, because uh, they're different chromosomes, essentially, or different genes. They can be different chromosomes uh, coming together to create the, the phenotype. We want to keep them together. All right? So if we do a, a Punnett square in the same format that you did before with a one-factor cross, we would say big R, big Y, big R, big Y makes this genotype and exhibits this phenotype. All right. 
Uh, so same concept applies to our uh, Punnett square over there that Allison is color coding. All right. <laughs> so if we were to expect the ratio of 9 to 3 to 3 to 1, all right, uh, if, if they have a big F, what does that mean? I mean, you're going to have freckles. Yeah, freckles is the dominant trait. All right, so any genotype that has a big F, we're going to see freckles. All right, what about if we have a big T? You're able to curl your, curl your tongue. Yes, that is the dominant trait. Anytime we see a big tree, a big T, that is going to be the trait. All right, now as so we see little f, little f, we know that's the recessive genotype. That's the only time the recessive uh, phenotype can occur. All right, we do not have freckles. The same with little l, little l. All right, excuse me, t, little t, little t. All right, if they are both little, they are both recessive. That is the only time we're going to see this recessive phenotype come through. All right. So Allison has done a great job here. All right, depending on how you split out the, the eggs and the sperm and what order you write them in, you might not get this pretty chart. Like this one has like going from yellow cascading to green. All right, you might not see it lined up like that, but we should expect a 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio there. All right. I'm going to move on to the next slide. So I think Allison has done a great job. Well, I'm not going <laughs> to pain you to do every single one color coded here. All right. So those uh, two laws that we went over are very crucial. So I'd recommend if you don't understand the law of separation or independent assortment, <laughs> give this video a look. Um, maybe it'll help clear things up for you. And if it doesn't, uh, come ask me questions. All right, so that's the homework you should have done for today. That was it for that slide. We're just finishing up our, uh, the slide that we started on Wednesday. All right, so now we're going to go into the next slide. All right, so we just went over Mendel's laws, and they are true for all genes, all right, but not all characters follow that 3 to 1 or the 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio, all right? So there are uh, some uh, differences that we can see here, and we're going to explore those. All right, so the first one could be linkage, all right? Genes can be linked together. So if we look at a chromosome, we don't just have one gene on one chromosome, all right? We can have like hundreds to, uh, to a few thousand genes on one single chromosome, all right? Now, when two genes are close together on the same chromosome, they tend to be transmitted as a unit, all right? So that phenomenon is known as linkage, all right? If they're close together, they're transmitted together. All right, so if they, uh, groups of genes that stay together is called a linkage group. And linked genes that are close together on the same chromosome are not going to follow the law of independent assortment. All right, if they're linked together, uh, if they, one of them uh, assorts into one gamete, all right, the linked gene to that gene that is sorted into that single gamete is also going to be assorted. All right, they're not independent of each other. All right, so there's a couple experiments done that uh, kind of showed this point of linkage. All right, the first was, was with sweet peas. All right, so Bateson and Punnett, they crossed sweet peas for flower color and pollen shape. All right, so we see purple flowers with long pollen, red flowers with round pollen. All right, they crossed them, looked at the F1 <coughs> offspring. But when they looked at the F2 offspring, they got some unexpected results. All right, so the offsprings showed the four phenotypes, but not in that 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio. All right, if it was 9, 3, 3, 1, we would expect independent assortment. All right, but this is not what they saw at all. Instead, the offspring had a much higher rate of looking like their parents, all right, than being crossed. All right, so this rejected that hypothesis of independent assortment. All right, so if we looked at the observed number here and the observed ratios, all right, we have 15.6 to 1 to 1.4 to 4.5. All right, that's a very different ratio. And most of them ended up looking like the parental types that they initially crossed. 
All right, there's also another experiment done with fruit flies. All right, T. H. Morgan found this same result when he looked at fruit flies. All right, so when different genes are located on the same chromosome, those traits are, are determined by those genes that are more likely to be inherited together. All right, so if we look at this here, uh, the next point is that crossing over uh, can exchange pieces of chromosome and create new combinations of alleles. All right, that is still true if they're linked, but it's much less common. All right, so if we looked at those that are not linked, all right, they're farther apart on the chromosome. All right, we have A and A, we have B and B, all right, gene 1, gene 2. Crossing over occurs. All right, we might get some uh, that stay put, that no crossing over occurs. But we might get crossover and we might see uh, 1B to 2A or 1A to 2B. All right, we can get new allele combinations. But if we look at these linked genes, all right, we see that one gene has an A and an A, uh, another, or excuse me, chromosome has an A to an A, another chromosome has a B to a B. If crossing over occurs, it's likely that they're going to cross over together because they are linked. So if we look at the resulting uh, combinations here, we still have a B and B, we still have an A and A, a B and B, and an A and A. All right, they might have just crossed over to the homologous chromosome, but they're crossed over together. All right, so there's no allele, new allele combinations between these two genes. And again, look how close they are on that chromosome. All right, so that brings us to this third point. All right, the frequency of crossing over depends on the distance between the two genes. So if we look at this section of chromosome, all right, we have gene G, C, and L. All right. Between G and L, we have a 17% of our <coughs> recombination frequency. So 17% of the time, uh, they, will be, uh, they will be involved in crossing over. All right. But if we look at them that are closer together, like G and C, or C and L, we see that that frequency really goes down. All right? It becomes much slimmer because they're closer together. All right? So if you think about a chromosome and where it has to break, all right, if we have a gene that's up tall and a gene that's down low, there's a lot of room in between for breakage to occur. All right? Versus two genes that are right next to each other, breakage has to occur in that very, very specific location, so that's less likely to happen. All right, so Morgan looked at fruit flies, and when we look at fruit flies, they have different ways of denoting uh, dominant and recessive alleles. All right, so this plus indicates a dominant allele. All right, so uh, he crossed two different types of fruit flies, one with gray body and a straight wings, crossed with a black body and curved wings. All right, now the black body curved wings, these are the recessive type. All right, now as expected, all the F1 had gray bodies and straight wings, all right? They showed all the dominant traits, all right? But now he mated it with a homozygous recessive for both traits to produce F2, all right? So in flowers, we can self-pollinate, all right? That's pretty easy to do, but we can't self-mate in fruit flies, all right? We have to mate it with another fruit fly, and this is called a test cross. When you mate it with a fruit fly, that's totally a homozygous recessive. All right, so he did a test cross, and what he found, again, is these odd ratios. All right, so he should have found a one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one ratio by using a test cross, all right, but that is not what he observed. He once again observed that the most common ones, all right, so the number observed 371 and 359, all right, the most common ones looked like the parents. All right, same thing we saw in those pea plants. The most common ones looked like the parents. Now, there are some where recombination did occur, all right, so it still can happen, but a much lower frequency. Again, because those genes are more likely to be closer together, they're linked genes. All right, and I just said this, all right, but the same slide, or this slide uh, reiterates the same concept that the majority of the offspring looked like the parents. <laughs> all right, and this is where we get some terminology coming into play, all right? So if we say that the uh, resulting offspring are non-recombinants, all right, there are going to be trait combinations uh, like those of the parents, all right? Basically, no recombination has occurred, 
a smaller number of offspring are going to be recombinants, right? Different combination of traits from the parental to the um, offspring here. So these are non-recombinant. They look the same as what they started with. These are recombinant because crossing over had occurred. All right, some terminology there to put things into context. All right. So let's step back and make sure we understand what's going on with these linked genes. All right, so I want you to review as a group uh, these three questions. And feel free to collaborate. What is the law of independent assortment? Who wants to answer that one? No one's feeling confident. Yeah. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Different genes are not going to affect how each other are going to be crossed over. They're crossing over independently, right? Regardless of what the other gene is doing. All right, so how do the previous two experience, uh, experiments violate this law? It has to do with ratios. The ratios, <laughs> the ratios were off, all right? We saw uh, instead of the 9 to 3 to 3 to 1, we saw that there were uh, more of the parental phenotypes showing through, all right? We did not get that nice ratio. All right, so how can this be explained? Why did we not get that 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio? What's happening with the genes? Are they sorting independently? No, they are no longer sorting independently, right? They're sorting together, which means they are linked. All right, so this is where we get linked genes. Does this make sense to everybody? I see a lot of confused faces. If we have time on Monday, maybe we'll come back and retouch on this, unless you have immediately, immediate questions right now. All right. All right, so now we're going to talk about sex-linked inheritance. All right, so we're still talking about linked genes. All right, if those genes are going to uh, be passed on together, all right, when we're talking about sex-linked inheritance, it means those genes happen to be on sex chromosomes. All right, so sex chromosomes are found in many species of two sexes. 
right? We're going to focus on that XY system, but no, there are many other systems out there. So males have an X and a Y chromosome. Females have two X chromosomes. All right, now in humans, that X chromosome is larger and carries more genes, all right, than that Y chromosome. So because it's larger and carries more genes, we can have genes found on the X, but not the Y. Right? We call these X-linked genes because they're only found on the X chromosome. They are linked to that X chromosome. Now, we can get Y-linked genes, but they're uh, much less common, right? simply because the Y chromosome is uh, smaller. It doesn't have as many genes. All right? So males are, are what we call hemizygous for the X-linked genes. And they only have one copy of a particular <laughs> gene. Right? So females have two copies of X. Males have an X and a Y, so only one copy of X. And we see during meiosis, these X and these Y chromosomes are going to split out just like we would see every other um, chromosome going through meiosis. Right? So 50% of the sperm are going to contain an X, 50% of the sperm are going to contain a Y, if we're talking about a male individual. All right, so one of the uh, most famous cases is hemophilia. And in your uh, video that you should have watched for today, it kind of covered this disease. So this is an X-linked recessive disease, right? Most famous because it happened in the European royal families. All right, so here we have Queen Victoria. Uh, we can see that because her circle is cut in half, circle meaning she's a female, cut in half means she's a carrier, all right? So she is heterozygous for this trait. All right, and so we can see that she passed it all the way down until finally we get to Alexis here. Uh, Alexis is a male. He only has one X chromosome, and that one X chromosome he inherited happened to have the recessive uh, trait for uh, hemophilia. <coughs> all right, so if we look at this in more technical terms, all right, we can see we have a normal female, uh, two large dominant H's, a female with hemophilia is going to have these two small recessive H's. Uh, if you have a big H and a little H, because the big H is dominant, all right, it's going to overshadow the little H. So you're going to carry the allele for hemophilia, but you're not going to exhibit hemophilia. All right? Now, a normal male is going to have a big H for its X, and a male with hemophilia is going to have a little H for its X. All right? So if we cross them together, we can see that in some crosses here, as long as the female has this recessive gene, we can get a male that has an X with a recessive uh, H on it. All right? Is that making sense for everybody? I think sex-linked inheritance is a little easier to understand than just plain out linked genes. We can also see this in fruit flies. All right? So again, fruit flies, they label their dominant and their recessive a little differently. All right? So the most common is the wild type. All right, and the wild type is going to have a dominant or a large W indicating uh, the dominant gene. All right, so in this case, this large W is standing for red eyes. All right, because that's the wild type that you normally see. And so, if we do these reciprocal crosses, we can see all the possible combinations that can occur. All right, I'm not going to go through it because it's exactly the same thing that we saw with the hemophilia. All right, but I do have a question that's going to challenge your thinking about sex-linked genes. All right, so go through this example of Heather being colorblind <laughs> and why the teacher knew that her father was colorblind as well. All right, so talk it out amongst yourselves. <laughs> I'm going to say, father's 
All right, but we know something about genetics, so we can say this in genetic terms. <coughs> Any ideas? Yeah, exactly, because males get their X chromosomes from their mom and Y from their dad. Exactly. So if she got, or if a colorblind male got an X chromosome from their mom, all right, their dad is a uh, I mean, the dad theoretically could be colorblind, all right, but it's not a given, all right, because one of those X little C's <laughs> could have come from his mom. All right, is everything making sense in this question? Awesome, we have a little bit of time here. All right, we can have an instance where we have more than two alleles at a single locus, all right, so remember a locus is where we find the alleles for a gene on a chromosome, it's that physical location. And we can have more than two alleles there. And a good example of this is human blood type alleles. All right, so big I, big A, is basically saying that on our plasma membranes of our red blood cells, <coughs> we are adding a galactose, all right, making uh, an A blood type. Uh, for a B blood type, all right, we are adding a galactosamine uh, to the red blood cell membrane lipids. And if we don't have uh, an A or B associated with it, it's just a little I, no sugar is added. All right, so we can get these different possible phenotypes and different blood types. All right, so it can have be an A type blood, B type blood, A B blood, or an O blood. All right, now the thing about uh, blood is that we have this A B type, all right, which is unusual when we're talking about genes. And A B, they are both co dominant. All right, so one allele is not going to mask the expression of the other. They're both going to be expressed. They are both dominant. All right, so that's what makes blood type kind of unique in that aspect. All right, again, uh, this image is just showing you uh, the different blood types, different <coughs> genotypes you can have. And then uh, I'm not going to get into this too much, but we can go through and add antigens into the blood to see which blood type you are. Now, maybe you've done this in high school. Maybe you've done this in some other labs. Um, but this would be the process by which you would do it. I'm not going to go into detail. All right. I do have another group question. 
give it a shot in the last two minutes, and we might potentially come back with this next Monday. All right, but before you leave, because I see some people packing up, I am going to show you what the homework is. All right, so uh, we didn't get to this. I would like you to watch the link to the bottom here. It's like a three-minute video. It's going to tell you the difference between quantitative and qualitative traits. Super easy to understand. We can review it on Monday. All right, but on Monday, we're going to be talking about eugenics. All right, and I just kind of wanted to put a warning out there that this topic contains the harsh treatment of groups of people in the 1900s. All right, so come prepared knowing that you might see some harsh treatment. We're going to watch a couple videos, talk about it a little bit. All right, so for those of you that want to keep doing this question, have at it. Otherwise, class is over in like a minute. Yeah, you should.